What's up, peeps and geeks, heroes and associates? This is Talking With Burritos, the podcast that's giving you something to talk about when you decide you want to talk about your fears and the movie It. I am Jerry J.J. Wayne Graham, and what is it about fear that intrigues us? Is it the mystery of the unknown or the thrill of the experience that we find so alluring? Some people are born fearful, while in others, fear comes with living our everyday lives and encountering things that make us feel uneasy and or apprehensive. Either manifested from our own psychosis or an event, fear is natural and actually healthy. When I was 12 or so, my father convinced me, okay, well, kind of forced me, but whatever, you know, child abuse, to ride the infamous carnival ride known as the zipper now pops knew i was afraid but i didn't want to chicken out in front of him and i said a prayer just out of earshot don't close your eyes but if i don't close my eyes god won't hear me shit oops sorry god i didn't like heights but i never questioned why i did not like heights i came upon this revelation that tight spaces turned me into a writhing lunatic back when i was a kid wrestling in the backyard with my cousins and friends now, if someone got me in the headlock or the full Nelson, I would freak out to the point of tears. This always made me look weak, but I couldn't explain that what had happened was I was having a panic attack. I didn't know what a panic attack, a panic attack was at that time, and I'm sure no one else within my circle of hazen hornets did either. Now, the zipper exploits a combination of both my fear of confined spaces and heights. Pops just laughed and patted me on the shoulder afterwards. You okay? And I would nod, holding in tears because tears were for fears and I was still in full man mode. I told myself I would never ride that damn ride again, but then again, years later, this woman calls out my manhood. Early on in my wife's pregnancy, my uh, early on in my wife's first pregnancy, um, she guilted me into riding the zipper again after a lot of begging and pleading. You know, I relented and I told her I was only doing this because I loved her. And that was the first time I uttered those words in that context to that woman or to this woman or to my wife. I've been on other rides since that time in 1997, but very few. Actually, my f next fear factor moment will be zip lining. I'll say, okay, not fear factor moment, life defining moment will be somewhere on a zip line. I have this overwhelming desire to travel down a zip line, to go down a zip line. However, it has to be by my own initiation. It can't be for my wife. It can't be for any sort of pride. It has to be just because I want to do that thing. Now, fear can either hinder you or help propel you to boundless heights. Most of our goals and accomplishments are synonymous with being afraid. Life-changing moments such as getting married, giving birth, applying for the job of your dreams. It's all a part of that thing that humanizes us and allows us to cherish those moments we find most dear. That's why I loved the movie It. The film keeps the spirit of the book, which wasn't about a clown. It was a coming of age story about a group of friends who had overcome unthinkable odds to defeat an entity far greater than them. Now, in the previous episode, I talked about what it takes to make or to successfully adapt a film from a pre-existing source material like a novel. In my movie watching experience, the best way to adapt anything into a film is to maintain the spirit of the original source material. Make whatever creative decisions necessary to complete the project, but it is most important to keep the spirit of the movie fresh or else the film suffers. Think about the audience you're trying to attract. You're trying to attract those who already know this thing that already exists out there. And you're just recreating it. So you can do everything you want creatively, but you have to keep the actual 
sensibility of the thing that you're adapting current. Once we read a, a novel or watch or anything like that, let's say we read a novel. But in this instance, okay, it, it was a novel and a TV series. But in the instance that we read a novel and we really love these characters, say Harry Potter or Twilight or Fifty Shades of Grey. Okay, Fifty Shades of Grey, because that was a lot of uproar over, over that one. You have this novel that you read and you have these characters, Christian Grey and Scarlet. I don't know what her name is. Abigail. What is that girl's name? Christian Grey. Whatever. Let's, let's say him. And within our minds, we have this picture of this guy, what he looks like how he talks, but then they announce a movie, and it's like, oh my goodness, um, they're going to mess it up. And then they cast someone, and you're, and, and immediately, that cancel out, cancels out everything that you, any previous thought, any other image that you had of this character in your mind, because now, why? Because why? They put a picture to it. They put a face to it. And now it's not the face that just resides within your own mind. They've actually put it, it in physical form. And no matter how many times I can read, I read, um, what, The Hunger Games or Twilight, I would think Kristen Stewart and Jennifer Lawrence immediately. But in my mind, before I read, when I just read the books, I was like, okay, well, I have a totally different perception. This person looks like this in my mind. But then they put a face to it, and it's like, okay, now I can't get that image out of my head. The image I had before is gone. They wiped it out. They moved it out of, my, out of my mind. And so when you adapt something, it's very important to actually just keep the sensibility of it. Because even in my mind with these kids and it, I didn't really have a picture of them. You know, I kind of associated them with kids that maybe I knew back in the 80s. Which is something I really liked about this movie. It really captured the look and feel of the movies I grew up with loving and watching on repeat. Like many of them were early 80s releases. But I, don't, I didn't watch them until my father procured a VHS player and a trunk load of movies from a friend who had to move overseas. Movies like E.T., Goonies, and The Lost Boys come to mind and they all centered around the not-so-popular kid. Now, I was never a cool kid. I would have to say I was never like a real cool kid. And that's why I relate to Ben Haskell. Let me step back. I wasn't a cool kid growing up. I wasn't one, uh, I was one that was always looked down upon, basically because of where, who, of where, of, uh, where I was from, clothes I wore, the way I looked. I didn't gain like, let's say pseudo popularity until I got here until I moved to Arizona from Alaska and Alaska was kind of cool because Alaska was cool because we just had, I had a, a, a group of friends and we were all pretty much cool. But then you also had the cool kids who, you know, kind of looked down upon you and they will pick on you every now and then. But I had fun with my group of friends and will we say we were part of, of losers? No, but I think we got kind of like tread the line. We were just right smack dab in the middle. And that's where I kind of like to be. I like to be in the middle where I could relate. I could talk. I could relate on my own level. And then I can go. I can relate with anyone on any level. Whether you're higher than me or lower than me in social status or whatever. I can relate to you because we're all humans, right? I could always do that because I could associate with both. Except for the higher ups. Couldn't really associate that with that too much. I never felt comfortable if like the cool kids let me into their group. It was weird. But, but yeah, so I was never that popular until like, okay, known or that likable. <laughs> Let's just say, I don't know. I gained a little bit of popularity when I came down here from Arizona, uh, from Alaska. And that was only because I had that new kid smell. I was new to the state. I was new to the school and people knew nothing about me. So I could recreate any, my, I could recreate myself. I could reimagine myself and then recreate myself in that image to become whatever they wanted me to be whatever was suitable f for me to fit in so i would just do that and i just became what i just became a kid who i was just i was just me i guess you know I, I would like to say it was me but i think i became more of a quiet kid because i never liked acting out i would say because before when i was a kid 
when I was younger, up in you know, people a lot of people would say I was goofy. Because I would just say stupid things. I would go around and do stupid things. And maybe I was annoying. It's possible. And so later after criticism, you know, you you reach junior high. And it's like, okay, well, I'm gonna, going to create an entirely different persona. And that persona became shy boy. I was a shy boy. But, you know, I would talk to my friends, but I was a shy boy. And I played ball, basketball, ran for student council, uh, was on the yearbook squad, I mean, team, yearbook. I was in journalism, all that stuff. So I kind of created myself to be kind of an introvert, extrovert type person. But that was me. And so I kind of relate a lot to like to Ben Haskam in this story. You know, but I wasn't fat, but I was self-conscious about like my big lips, my gap teeth, and always, even to this day, I feel like I felt like an outsider or I feel like an outsider. So I really related to Ben Haskam in this story. With these, these awesome castle characters. I have to, you know, but yet, <laughs> you know, so much so, so much so I relate to this character that when, during my second viewing of the movie It, I just, during this one scene, I called Beverly, Bev, whatever, I called her a bitch. I was just out loud and people, like this dude next to us, my wife and I, uh, this guy next to us is just cracking up. But it was a reaction to this scene in the garage where she thanks Ben for saving her life, but hugs Billy. I, as a self-proclaimed friend zone member, knew exactly what that character felt in that moment. And oh, by the way, the friend zone does exist. And more on that later. Actually, if you guys want to hear this episode that I recorded a long time ago, it's one of our first seasons of this Talking with Burritos things. The first years when there were like five of us doing this podcast. If you want to hear me and Josh hammer out a debate about this topic, go to TalkingWithBurritos.com. Actually, Facebook or Instagram or what? Twitter and just go hashtag show your burrito. Show your burrito friend zone. I will upload that episode for you guys it's actually rather enjoyable and it's one of my wife's favorite episodes because me and josh we just kind of get real silly in that in that one but let's go back to the movie it and nostalgia uh that's a lot of that's what i have to say if there was one word to describe this movie it would be nostalgia such as like riding bikes you know bikes were our vehicles to adventure like riding bikes through the neighboring towns or to the store or some of or where some of are are some of the more memorable moments to my childhood there was oh, something so there was something so carefree about trekking to some place with a gaggle of friends on a group of bicycles and there were several shots in it that really made me rejoice in those past memories for one particular shot it was this long shot of the six friends on bicycles riding up Kneebolt Street and they come to a stop outside the house on Kneebolt Street this creepy house where resides an entity something that is dangerous and evil as they contemplate what they're going to do they hop off of their bicycles and just allow them to fall over in the street what about the coolness of riding your bicycle up to a house and then hopping off your bike as it continues forward and a, a forward for a stint before crashing into its sides? You know, you when you get so excited, you rush home from something or you're running home from something and uh, you reach home and you just kind of hop off your bicycle in one stride and you're still running or walking and the bicycle just kind of goes and crashes into something and falls over. I loved bicycles and I believe it was working on bicycles that taught me how to take things apart and reassemble them again, you know, because I wasn't one who, I don't think I had a bike of my own until I was like maybe 10 or so, 10 or 11. And a lot of what I learned to do was, you know, with the help, help of some adults is just gather parts from other bicycles and put them together, change out tires and all that stuff. We were, you know, I really learned that trait. A lot of us were knowledgeable in that area of tinkering with things. Because when you don't come from much and you don't have much, you find ways to use, reuse thrown out items. 
And that was, it, I thought that was a valuable lesson. So I loved bicycles. And a lot of the, a lot of that happened, a lot of the, on the bicycle just adventures really happened in the summer. Several times it was mentioned in this movie about the joy of summer. Like your duties as a kid should be out spending time with friends. If you loved with, um, if you lived with my Mima, you had to get out of the house early or she would find work for you to do. I don't remember wanting to stay at home a lot of the times because that was just boring. With no television rights, summer was definitely, definitely the time to get into trouble or find or create your own entertainment. Whether it was stickball, football, or talking to the girl whose parents locked her in the house for the summer, there were times to be had. We used to leave the house in the a.m. and not return home until dinner time. I can't imagine a world in which now I would allow my children to do so, so freely. Some people blame the homebody kid phenomenon on television and video games, or on the fear that they will get hurt, kidnapped, or worse. It's true, video games are a factor, but they are not the cause for our children's reclusivity. It's us, the parents. Video games provide the homebody kid with entertainment. If we don't allow kids outside, how else do they find adventure? Books, movies, uh, music, and video games are essential to satiating the minds of kids with some sort of world worldly exploration when they can't go outside because why maybe it's not so safe the same creeps doing bad things these days nowadays are the same type of creeps who did bad things back when we were we the parents were younger our parents knew about the horrors of the outside world and now as parents we are aware of the dangers of the outside world as uh, of the world outside our home as well. But it's a little different now. We just keep our kids inside. When I was young, I lived in a neighborhood where everyone knew everyone. And small towns like this and like the town presented in the movie and book It, Derry, uh, or is it Deary? Deary with the D, D-E-R-R-Y, they are, they are usually safer havens for children than larger cities. It's just because of the community and because of people knowing one another and knowing each other and knowing your kids and knowing you and just developing developing those type of relationships. In this movie and in the book, the kids from Derry, they hang out. They had this spot, hangout spot called the Barrens, which wasn't exactly a safe place, but it was a place where kids felt safe. I do remember hanging out in locations like this around drains, lakes, ponds, um, inside the woods. <laughs> we would create and play games or just sit around and talk. It was in those moments you would usually reveal things about yourself that you swore to never tell a soul. Uh, we kids always found consolation in each other in our more private moments. Like in that scene with Beverly and Ben at the bike rack. There were many moments, many more moments like this in the book. They are so true to the relationships of people brought together out of boredom of being in a small town with nothing better to do than befriend a stranger. This isn't like actually a, let's say, a negative to the movie. But Pennywise didn't, did really nothing for me in the scare department. Bill Skarsgård did a great job at creating his own interpretation of this menacing dancing clown. However, it was just the kids who outshined him in this picture. And it was and it was fitting for them to do so, for the kids to be the actual focus of the movie. Because once you make it about the clown, I'm pretty sure it would have really curtailed, uh, interrupted the plot of the story. And made it more into a, hey, look at Pennywise type movie. Look and see what he can do. Look and see how much he can scare you. I could see, I could easily see them go in a totally different direction with this movie if they focused more on the iconic clown. Which, to his detriment, 
to Bill Skarsgård's detriment or to the detriment of the character, you know, this iconic clown, which was played by Tim Curry back in the 1980s, you know, it really set a precedent for the for any future remakes of this movie, which there were and have been none. And so the only clown that we know is the clown is the Pennywise presented to us by Tim Curry. And he did an awesome job to so much of a great job that even to this day, a lot of the people who grew up around that time remember that clown. That is their representation of the bad clown. With that clown being so iconic, it's very hard to even consider anyone outshining Tim Curry or undoing what Tim Curry did for that character. It falls into the line of like, you know, the Joker, where Heath Ledger presented this Joker, this really demented, great character. And it was so iconic that any other Joker after uh, The Dark Knight would never, you know, own up to, live up to it. Now, Jared Leto, in my opinion, gave a good, good interpretation of a Joker, but not the Joker. You can even say that for Jack Nicholson. Heath Ledger didn't try to do Jack Nicholson. Jared Leto didn't try to do Heath Ledger. So you have to create your version of the character and not the person who made that character famous, if you understand. And also recently, you know, we just heard Ron Perlman will not be in the next Hellboy movie. However, the cat that they have playing him and the costume design looks completely awesome. So it will be interesting to see what they, how they go forward with that character as well. Such an iconic character. People all know his face. We all know him as Ron Perlman. Hellboy is Ron Perlman. No one else. But hey, it's up to this next person, this next iteration, this next remake, a reincarnation of the character to really set to do his own thing and make his character make his version of the character and not the not try to do or outdo the version the versions created before him that came before him you can't recreate or be Ron Perlman you would have to be now Hellboy 2018 so you know the movie was just as advertised. Was the movie as advertised? Yes. The movie is great. If anything, if you haven't read the book, you don't need to read the book to actually enjoy this horror movie. However, it's not a true example of horror. I feel that if you really want the true horror horror from the novel, then just read the book. Seriously, just the way Stephen King worded that novel is just great. You know, it's structured well. And some of the horrific scenes or the terrifying scenes are actually scary. So go watch that movie. Check it out. I do recommend it. Like hands down. Watch it two, three times. Go watch that movie. And now for the news with this, that, and other news. I'll label this one. This is talk about fear of the unknown and cultural perception. Recently, this group known as the Juggalos descended upon Washington, D.C. in protests to the FBI, the government, putting them alongside, listing them actually, alongside gang-related gang um, organizations such as uh, Bloods, Crips, M13, some other mafia stuff. They were upset. They're basically upset that they're among this list. That now among these top dangerous gangs, organized gang organizations, you also have these juggalos. And juggalos, for me, I remember juggalos in high school, in the early '90s, and they were these kids who, I'm sorry, and they were these kids who would dress in Junko shorts, those big long baggy short shorts, and wear. Insane clown posse t-shirts. Now, every now and then, you would see them, see a few of them with face paint or, you know, mascara, some type of makeup on. But it was seldom during school hours. A lot of them I've seen, I've seen kids actually taken out of class to go to the office so that they could wash the stuff off of their face. 
Um, you know, I never considered these individuals as gang affiliated because if you walked around our school, there was a lot of gang affiliation there and it wasn't about any clowns. However, I did see them as a curiosity. And with that said, I, you know, I never spoke to them, not even if we shared a class together. They were kind of persona non grata. Uh, most of the kids who went after them did so out of ignorance and because, you know, of their appearance. Juggalos weren't violent unless they needed to be. And very often they were outmanned by their pestering, by other pestering to students. They were proud as shit, I've seen, unabashed by the label weirdo, which gave them a sort of power and presence. And in high school, that sort of recognition is a commodity. Now, since most people wouldn't know a juggalo from a hula hole, when you see a person in clown makeup just walking along the street, good thoughts don't spring to mind. So if you walk in, if so if you're walking around with clown makeup, you know, these people, no one knows you as a person per se. You know, they just fear your presentation. They fear how you present yourself. So you become guilty by association of sorts. And I say that in that since they feel that they're being criminalized, that free speech is being criminalized in the essence of the juggalo, you know, and the juggalo just became this movement after they became the fan movement of the insane, insane clown posse is this rap group. And what the insane clown posse was to, let's say, I mean, what NWA was to say, let's say, the culture of division in Los Angeles. Those who lived in a certain town, certain place, and dealt with a lot of different things, horrible things that they saw every day on an everyday basis. Stemming from that way of life inspired the music that the NWA presented to America. As with everything, rap is taking, a, a, a rap is a feeling, rap is a movement, rap is a cultural outcry. A lot of people spoke about the environments they live in. After the basically beginning, you know, once you got into the early 90s, late 80s, people start speaking about anything, the neighborhoods they're from, the things that they've done, the things that they've seen, a lot of it. It became less fun, less about, you know, just rhyme and beats and more about telling stories, telling stories of where you're from, telling stories of oppression, telling stories of pain, telling stories of hurt. Um, and so from, from that, we have in certain, I think they, they were like Southeast. I don't know where they came from. It could have been like Florida or something, but you know, this movement, this gave birth to like the inside, insane clown posse, Violent J and Shaggy P, Shaggy Tudo. They made music. That is a little, you know, it's different. You know, it's a little violent. It could be violent as as sorts. You can say, you know, it could be violent. It could say, you know, it could be very destructive. Some of the things that they say in their lyrics. But you can't say that, yeah, but I can say the same thing about NWA. I can say the same thing about a lot of other groups, you know. Uh, a, a lot of other rap groups during that time. Public Enemy, I can say a lot of, uh, I can relate them to a lot of groups. And so this is just their version. This is just their thing. And so from this movement, from their music, they developed a fandom. And so once you have the fandom, usually they get names. And so these the name for their followers, their fans, were our Juggalos. And they were basically just fans of the Insane Clown Potsy. Followers. People who would attend all the events and concerts and stuff. So now it's it becomes less about them I think. I think I don't think that the government maybe is criminalized crimin, criminalizing speech which they probably is. They were. You know, the government did criminalize speech of the sort where they made it a stigma. If you were part of a rap group, if you rapped and you said certain things, there was a stigma placed upon your music. And that's why you had NWA at the White House. NWA coming out on you know, ABC and all these different things, all these different outlets, Ice Cube. It's because, you know, they were just basically speaking their mind, telling you where they're from, the things that they've seen, the things that they've done. And that 
but it wasn't like they were telling people to go do things. You know, when they say fuck the police, it's just a reaction to what they experienced when they were growing up. So when you have those type of things come into play and you're saying things on your raps, it's not about what the words that are said. It's about how people um, interpret them. And not to say that, and to say that they're criminalizing free speech, I think is a little far stretch. Back in the 90s, even when the with the rise of the, the Juggalo movement, you had a lot of news outlets. Towards the late 90s, you would see different things come up in the news outlets about these, this group call them, calling themselves Juggalos, followers, fans of the insane clown posse. You would see this stuff on the news, and they would do certain things. They would do criminalizing things. You kind of you have to you know, like maybe just say maybe that's just a price of fandom, a price of celebrity because it's not about the group. Maybe it's not, it's most likely not about the music because you know I can like Eminem and I can say all uh, everything that he was saying about his wife and Kim and all that stuff was great, but that doesn't make me want to go out there and hurt my wife or do this other thing. It doesn't make me want to like um, what if I want to be. You know, if I listen to NWA, it doesn't make me want to go out and sell drugs or something like that or move out to Compton and become a gang member. No, it doesn't make me want to do any of that. Great music. And to a point, you know, it did give you a little bit of angst once you listen to NWA and some of the things they were speaking about. And I remember, I remember being a stupid kid when I went down to Arkansas and my cousins and I was just learning about gangs and all this stuff like that because I was I came from Ar- I came from Alaska and next thing you know they're like oh you talk white what's wrong with you, and then they were introducing me to oh don't wear your hat, hat like that I'm like why because of this this is crip related this is gang related um, blood related you can't wear your hat like that so I'm like oh okay how about I just take the hat off, and then we would have like some things I never really saw before it was police officers you know canvassing the neighborhood just driving through and. You have my friends and some of my uh, some of the older people in the neighborhood walk around with big old boom boxes, you know, just blaring "fuck the police." And it's like, wait, this is I only been I was only away for like maybe two and a half years, and things had changed so drastically. So during that thing, it's not about how people; it's how people interpret the music and how they relate it to where they are living in their lives. So in this time, yes, people were doing stupid things and that, but during my time, it was the rise of the gang movements. You know, you had Bang It On Little Rock. I lived in Arkansas. You had all these different things. You know, all these different gang gangs were really becoming prevalent and prevalent in certain societies. I mean, certain cities and certain towns. So, as an example of you know what can happen when things get misconstrued. You know, and I say that the misdeeds of a few will usually become the semblance of a whole. Such as with this, you they they were criminalizing back in 2011. I think they put their names on the list, uh, the Juggalos on the list. But it's not. I wouldn't say that it's based on the music. I wouldn't say anything like that. But the music does play a part. Whereas it created something. It created something that people could attach themselves to. So by association to this cause. If you walking around with the Hatchet Man logo, which is the logo of the Juggalo, or you walk around with a T-shirt nowadays, you know this is what I read in this article. People might look at you side eye. Now me, uh, maybe now I will know. You know if I looked at any something somebody's shirt, I'm like, oh, I know where that's from. But you know I could give a damn because I don't even have a clue. So it, it has to be specific to some area. So I'm thinking like. Florida area, lower southeast America. I'm thinking it's fervent a little bit around there, but you don't really see much in the news about it. So I don't really know where the concern comes from. But yet, I do remember during the late 90s, early 2000s, that there were a lot of news reports about criminal activity being initiated by this juggalo group, gangs of people who are associated or associate themselves um, with insane clown posse. Just saying. 
It's not to say that they were bad or good, but it's just sometimes you're just guilty by association, and this sucks. But, you know, do you think, like, Keyshawn Watson from Roanoke, Virginia, was representing the Crenshaw Mafia if he just wore a Los Angeles Raiders hurt hat to school? Nah, it was a style at the time, a trend. Now, Keyshawn is in normality, you know, he's a bass brat with a penchant for playing chess and the spelling bee, but, but he loves rap music. And his dad, who is over in Kuwait, is a Los Angeles fan. Keyshawn is not a gang member, but he is guilty by association of possessing known artifacts related to gang activity. <laughs> Just as a person with a Hatchet Man logo or a face painted like a clown, you're going to be scrutinized. It's inevitable. And until the FBI deem it acceptable to not fear the group of people as a whole that they are no longer a threat, then you can continue to fight for awareness for your cause if you're trying to defend your music in this sense. But a lot of time it's not about the music. This is all about the juggalos as a whole and some of the acts individuals are committing, these criminal acts that some of these individuals are creating as a whole. So the FBI isn't criminalizing free speech, in my opinion. They are just afraid of all the idiots using their label, the insane clown posse label and fandom fan base as a symbol for their, just, uh, for their destructive actions. Just saying. So you can find a very interesting article. This guy, uh, Mitchell Sutherland from Vice, he wrote, it's called What the Fuck Happened at the Juggalo March on Washington. And you can find that article over at talkingwithburritos.com slash fear. Let's go on to another clown. And I say that lightly. I use that term lightly in all my heart because, you know, comedians are clowns, technically, by definition, kind of. From origin, from origins, you know, court gestures, clowns, all that, comedian jokes, boom. So this is just about fear. This is about Kevin Hart and his recent ordeal. This is just my dish. This is Jay's dish. Well, I get a little bit introspective about something else, um, about something that really struck me as interesting. Not necessarily like I give a damn, but. It was interesting, and I had a thought about it. And it fell into my lap as I was writing the notes. For this episode, so I thought, you know what, why not say it? And it concerns Kevin Hart's recent admission that he put himself in a situation where his integrity may have been compromised. And that someone or someone is now attempting to extort money from him. The evidence in, in question is either a video and or a picture. And we're not surprised. Why? Because that's the way of the world nowadays. And taking videos and having videos and having the capability to take videos record audio you can basically pin somebody for something you know if you if you're slick enough now people like money and will almost go to any lengths to obtain wealth even if it comes at the expense of someone else's happiness like a man who has just got married and is having a baby now not to say mr hart kevin mr hart i'll say mr hart formal informal because i don't know this cat I would say, not to say Mr. Hart is innocent in all of this, but damn. A social media apology. I hate those. Why can't celebrity skeletons stay at home in the closet like everyone else's? This is none of our damn business. This is a personal matter and it should have stayed at home. But since he made it public, I had a thought about it. So if if the strategy was to get ahead of this media blitz and stifle the means of said extorter, or extortionist trying to earn money off of um, this supposed transgression, then this move was genius. Hypocritical, but genius. There were a few holes in this story, and it starts about sometime this summer when some lady alleged, and actually, that it, that she had a tryst with Hart or something like that, and then there wasn't there a picture a photograph snapped a shot of him getting out of a vehicle with a lady who was not his wife one evening, late evening in L.A. or something like that. Now, I'm not sure about the details, but I'm sure, but I'm certain that something like this did happen and that later he denounced it as hearsay in what another social media post. Scroll up and it's forgotten until 
this public apology to his wife that I didn't watch because I don't care. And if you already apologized to your wife and your children, why do you have to apologize to us? As a pseudo publicist, publicist, this was, I guess, the best move he could make to weaken the accuser's claim. Take the burden of the embarrassment by accepting his shame, but it doesn't make the things okay. And like Mr. Hart said, I'm not perfect. And we all know this because he told us this years ago after his divorce from his first wife. Mr. Hart stated, all but stated, that he was, let's say, weak to the flesh. You can hear him allude to this in um, the comedy special, Big Little Man. I think it was all there. So whatever happened and when it occurred doesn't matter. The deed's done. The contradicting matter of fact comes at the moment when you can identify the situation that you were put in as familiar territory, but then you decide to put your integrity aside to fulfill a selfish need. Now, again, we're not perfect, but to put blame on perfection because you're an imperfect person, that's a fool's defense. To come out and try to defend yourself to the public isn't needed because you're still a celebrity. People still are going to love you. And if R. Kelly has showed us anything, you can pee on people. You can piss on people. You can keep them as slaves. You can met, you can date underage girls. And people will still come to your defense and love you either way, just like my wife. This is Talking With Burritos. And that's a wrap, but not a burrito. Excuse me, waiter, waiter. Um, I, uh, we would like to order some dessert. Yes, for this Twilight Delight, for the dessert for this episode, this Twilight Delight comes in the form of um, an episode that we already discussed some time ago, almost a year ago, when we were talking about nightmares or Halloween. And it's called Five People in Search of an Exit. It involves a hobo, a clown, a ballerina, a tramp, and a general. They're all stuck in this space where there is no exit. And it's all about them trying to, it's all about one man, one person who is inside the box. He wakes up inside the box and starts freaking out. He starts thinking that, why are we still here? Because everyone else is pretty much complacent about their fate. They aren't going anywhere. We don't know how long they've been there. They don't know how long they've been there. They just know that they're there. They don't know for what reason. They don't know who they are, what kind of past they had, their present, their future, nothing. And this, you watch this man as this clown really chastise him and teases him and kind of pokes fun at him, basically telling him to accept his fate as being what it is here in this area with us four other individuals who don't know white from rice, but we're here, you're here, so you should just be here and suck it up and endure. But you watch the decay of this man's hope as he's stuck in this area and he wants to find a way out. Rather than accepting what is now his fate is to be in this spot with these four other individuals who have already lost hope and have given up hope and have just, you know, decided, hey, why try? So go check out that episode of... I think it's in season, let's see, let's see, what season is that in? So, Twilight Zone, five people in search. It's going to be five people in search of an exit, season three of the Twilight Zone, episode 14. It has a clown, so it's really relevant to this episode. And I told you, every episode of Talking With Burritos from here on out, I'm pretty sure we could have, if we were actually really active in pursuing this endeavor and you know, really attaching a Twilight Zone to every episode. We, I bet you we could find one because there are so many Twilight episodes out there that is relatable to like everything that's going on in the world right now or <laughs> anything that you watch. They have a relatable episode. That's my claim. But that's Talking With Burritos again. Check us out at TalkingWithBritos.com where we have contact information. We have blog show notes. We have everything over at TalkingWithBritos.com. So, thank you for listening, and I'm out.